Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Butzel Long's webinar, Automotive Industry Outlook and Navigating Financial Challenges as the COVID-19 Impact Continues. We will be covering a lot of ground during this afternoon's presentation, so please feel free to submit questions to the presenters using the GoToWebinar Questions panel. Our presenters will answer as many questions as they can at the end of the webinar, time permitting. Also, a copy of this presentation will be made available this afternoon on the webinar event page and in the Coronavirus Resource Center on Butzel.com. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I would like to introduce Butzel Long shareholder Beth Gotthelf and our presenters Mike Wall from IHS Market and Max Newman from Butzel Long. Beth? Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, everybody. It's, um, I would say, good to see you, but of course, we're not seeing you right now. So it's good to know all of you are there. We have over 60 people on this webinar right now and um, from a large assortment. Some of you are automotive suppliers. A lot of you are um, with our surface finishing industry. And, um, you know, and then, as I said, all sorts of other people. So good to see you on this. Um, as some of you know, one of my um, jobs, I am an attorney at Butts Long. I specialize uh, in um, environmental for a lot of companies, and I also do a lot of aerospace and defense work. And one of my many hats is that I am general counsel to the Michigan chapter of the National Association of Surface Finishers. And this program is being brought to you by Butts Long plus both the Michigan chapter and the National Association of Surface Finishers. And we thank you for that. And one of our um, popular speakers at, um, in our programs is um, Mike Wall, who gives us a, an overview of what's going on with the automotive world, because we really want to find out, you know, what to expect next year, what to expect five years down the road, and. We have had Mike, mostly we, we've had him speak during auto show week, but with life changed, you know, in March, we had him talk because it's like, oh my goodness, what impact will COVID have on our business right now? And so we really want to have a good understanding of it and ask Mike to speak to us at the end of March. Well, here it is, September 3rd, and Oh my gracious, have we changed quite a bit. So um, we've asked Mike to come speak again. Now, Mike is the executive director of the automotive analysis at IHS Market. You know, he has over 20 years experience in financial analysts and analysis and forecasting, consulting and manufacturing experience to the firm. And his main focus has been on financial firms and also manufacturers, especially automotive. And um, that's why we've asked him, and he's just had such great um, insight to that. And if you have any questions for him or afterwards, uh, when, just so you know, when Mike's done, I'll introduce our next speaker, Max Newman. If you have any questions for them, just use your chat bar and write those, and then at the end, we'll answer all those questions. So with this, I am going to turn you over to Mike Wall. Mike, it's all yours. All right, thanks so much, Beth. Really appreciate it. I appreciate uh, getting in front of everybody again. Uh, it's a good, uh, it's very timely still. Uh, and, and really what, what we wanna reveal here is a kind of a lay of the land and currently where we stand. And then looking even more importantly, maybe looking forward to 2021, because that's where I think everybody's lens is now shifting. You know, we're still in the thick of it, still in the soup, as it were. But um, some things are starting to maybe become a little a little more clear. And frankly, there's some a little bit better performance in some areas, a little bit uh, other areas we're going to have to keep our eyes out, eyes, eyes peeled yet for for some maybe some other headwinds. But just to set the stage and kind of how we currently see things. In this slide here, the sort of the COVID-19 autos assessment. So where where are we right now in the in the in the thick of it all? From an economic perspective, from a GDP perspective, it's tough. It's no doubt globally. You know, we're seeing global GDP contraction about five percent this year, with some recovery next year of about four percent, just over four percent. 
China real GDP growth of about one and a half percent, which still for China is not much growth at all. In fact, you could argue that's still somewhat recessionary. U.S. real GDP growth is is contraction, down 4.8 percent. Eurozone down 8.7 percent. So, from an economic perspective, the it's a lot of headwinds. But you'll see here in a moment, you know, automotive is actually performing, I would argue, better than how better than what some of the economic drivers might indicate, especially here in the U.S. and and, and perhaps in China as well. You know, one of the things we're keeping our eyes on are, are the you know the idea of around stimulus, auto incentives that are helping support demand. We're seeing that in Europe to some extent, um, also in China. We're not seeing it necessarily out overtly in terms of the U.S. We're not seeing those big, you know, like cash for clunkers kind of programs, but it is interesting to see how things like uh, the extension of the unemployment benefits and the enhanced unemployment benefits and that stimulus check earlier on in, in the uh, COVID situation. I do think that that's helped um, not just the new car market, but even more so perhaps the used car market, which has had a, a beneficial impact to, to the new car market as well, which we'll, we'll touch on in a moment. Just one more slide on the economic side of things, because I think this does frame it well. When you look at an economic uh, GDP perspective versus the, the last big frame of reference we have and what I think most of our eyes go, gaze back to is the great the global financial crisis, Great Recession. And it's interesting to see here the, the, the stark contraction we're seeing this time around versus uh, the Great Recession. It's deeper, most definitely. And in, in fact, during, during the Great Recession, we, had, we saw some markets still growing both from an economic perspective and even from an automotive perspective, China and India in particular. And certainly the, the contraction during the global financial crisis was not nearly as deep. Here, uh, the difference now, we're taking the punch all up front right at once, so it doesn't progress over like a two year period, uh, but it is more severe. And, it, and it's really kind of impacting all markets to some degree, to some way, shape or form, we're seeing that impact. So there are some differences, maybe some slight similarities, but I would argue probably more differences this time around. And even differences in how auto sales and, and, and really production are behaving, which is really what we'll get into in the, in the thick of this. So just to frame it up a little bit more, for 2020 in particular, obviously, COVID has is, is added a whole level of uncertainty that we're, we're wrestling with and we're, we're working through. Uh, instead of that two-year slump we saw during the Great Recession, we, this is a very immediate uh, impact, and we're starting to sort of dig our way out. And in that vein, sort of China at patient zero is emerging even as we speak, um, and, and emerging at a, at a fairly rapid clip, all things considered. Europe is still kind of in the mire, if you will. And we saw that with some of the sales announcements for August. Uh, some of those countries in, in Europe are still struggling, even with the incentives and the stimulus. So this is something that it's going to be a, a little bit more of a process, a, a digging out process there in the U.S. Boy, we saw really strong eight August sales here, um, here announced within the last couple of days. And we're starting to see that recovery um, heat up somewhat. Now we've got inventory issues <laughs> in terms of actually getting product out to the dealers. You know, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of the other uh, other potential on that front. And we are still keeping our eyes peeled for some of the other markets that are out there, rest of the world markets in particular, for the impact of possible virus flare-ups, Brazil, Russia, India. Those are all fat things we have to keep our eyes on. And I do have a slide we're going to talk on, you know, this whole new environment of work from home and, and how mobility may be shifting a little bit if we see some de-urbanization. De we'll touch on that a little bit as well and how that might impact our thinking around vehicle sales, both here in the near term and the intermediate to longer term. But when we pivot, let's talk about global light vehicle sales. We've got to take the, the bad medicine right up front. So here we look at our January forecast was in that dotted uh, green line, kind of giving you a pre-COVID measure versus where we are now with the solid line in August, in our latest August forecast. Now, I will tell you, we've made some upgrades to the forecast. And that's reflected in that August number, but boy, it's still a tough, tough, uh, tough, tough number for this year. And you can see it there with the table when you look at the various major markets, China down about 12%, U.S. down about 20%. We're sitting about 13.6 million units for our U.S. light vehicle sales figure for this year. I think there is some upside to that, especially when we see what happened with August. We'll touch on that in a moment. Western and Central Europe 
uh, down about 24%. And again, a little more sluggish with some of the countries in, in West Europe, especially with the August numbers. We're certainly hopeful that we'll start to see some pickup in September. I think we will in some areas, especially with some of the electrified and hybrid offerings as well. That's where those stimulus programs are particularly uh, pointed towards. But at the end of the day, we're still looking at about a 20% contraction in global sales. Now, that's a, that is something of an improvement over where we were um, only a few months ago in the middle midst of the COVID situation where we, we did we were expecting for a bit more of a fall off, you know, on the order, maybe closer to 25, 27 percent down. Uh, so we have made some upgrades. And again, it's owing to some of these major markets recovering a little bit better, China and, and U.S. in particular, and some light upgrades in, in Europe. Uh, light vehicle production, again, for your suppliers on the line that are building parts, you're building it for vehicles that are being produced. And you look at last year, you know, we were at 89 million units, global light vehicle production, it, which was already down from 2018. And again, China took their lumps last year uh, through a correction that was non-COVID related. And then going into this year, uh, you know, the wheels started to fall off, obviously. And then the impact of the virus has really set in. You know, just as a note for North America, coming into the year, we were expecting North America to be up about 200,000 units. And, you know, obviously the virus intervened and, and the fates of, uh, have altered that course. We're looking at North America down about 3.6 million units in terms of production. Europe down about 5.2. Again, South Asia, particularly India, down 3 million, and, and again, Greater China down 2.7. But the, the, that contraction is very much broad based, again, across all regions. So to get us down to this 70.5 million unit figure, again, down roughly 21% year on year, uh, which is very similar to the demand environment as well. Now, looking forward to next year, we are looking to add about 9 million units this next year versus this year. So growth is in the offing. Um, it's a different kind of snapback. Again, you know, we can debate whether it's a U-shaped or V-shaped. And I think for different markets, it's going to it's going to behave differently. Uh, but in terms of that recovery, it is going to be much more focused on China to an extent, certainly North America and Europe as well, um, driving a, 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 the lion's share of that growth. I would say probably 60 percent or so of that growth for next year. Now, production, I've got three slides kind of detailed, per, detailing production by major market, this starting with China. And what I've included here is trying to include a setting that would be kind of considered pre-COVID, and that's February, realizing that there's a little bit of COVID in there for China in February, but to give a measure of kind of before kind of the, the virus completely took hold, and then some successive forecasts, June, July, and August, in particular, August is our most recent forecast, just to show the, the magnitude of the forecast revisions and where we currently see things going. We've seen some balancing out in China. We've seen some improvement in vehicle sales. That is driving both uh, wholesale sales and retail. So think of wholesale as those shipments going to dealers, and then, of course, retail is going to the consumer. Um, we're starting to see more and more stock hitting the market. We have to keep an eye on inventory um, and make sure that that retail sales environment is still uh, behaving well and, per, uh, and performing well. But from a production standpoint, we have made some, some revisions, certainly relative to our June forecast with our latest August forecast. Production, particularly at those uh, joint venture facilities, are easily approaching 90% or better. Some of the domestic brands are maybe 70, 75, 80%. Uh, depends on the, the automaker for sure. Uh, but we are starting to see those, uh, we are starting to see more of a return to normalcy in terms of the ability to produce. And then it becomes all about, you know, again, demand and how demand performs. And, and that's where we are starting to see demand starting to come back. Um, we're trying to be a bit more measured in terms of our outlook because we do think the second half of the year may be a little bit harder, a little tougher because some of those government investment and stimulus programs start to wind down for the back half of the year. So we're certainly we're watching that very closely. You look at Europe, Europe fairly similar to China in terms of the huddling, the, the concept around the huddling of the forecast, we're finally starting to see a little less volatility in the actual forecast itself. If you were to see it in March, April, and May, a lot more volatility because frankly, the numbers were all over the map in terms of the numbers, in terms of vehicle sales, even production activity. Heck, some of these, some of these regions were down, not even producing and for a good portion of March and going into April. Uh, so that certainly impacted some of that as well. But the overall theme of the last few months, we've seen a much more tightness in terms of the forecast, <clears throat> the forecast volumes, if you will. We have made some, some more modest increases in forecasts for Europe, for sure. 
which we, which certainly what I referenced earlier. We've seen, for the most part, most of those plants have gotten back to normal, but there are still a few that are still kind of closing that gap. In August, we see Germany producing at roughly 90% of their pre-crisis levels, and, and Germany's one to watch in that area, just due to the sheer magnitude of their, their manufacturing footprint, if you will, and we've seen them, again, returning much closer to to a, a degree of normalcy, at least on, in terms of the production side of the equation. Now, again, we, we then take that handoff to sales to make sure that we've got the demand. And that's going to be something to watch, especially over the next quarter or so. Uh, we, we did see August, uh, maybe a little more underperformance in August after having some decent performance even in July, going into September and October are definitely going to be key, key months to watch as the sales progresses through the uh, through the rest of the year. August is a little bit more of a, uh, a weaker month in terms of sales activity in, in Europe. So we, we try not to put too much, uh, too much weight behind it overall, but it is something we're going to want to keep our eyes peeled on. And also watching for things like second wave and, and risk along that in terms of the virus. Let's touch on U.S. and we'll start digging into North America as well. Here we take a look at our latest U.S. light vehicle sales forecast in August and where we were in July. Again, just to show you a relative magnitude and where that progression's been. And I'll tell you, in terms of new vehicle sales, um, it, it's hard to be really positive and, and talk positively around a 13.6 million unit forecast for the year. Or even last month, we did 15 million unit selling rate um, when we did 17 million units last year. But indeed, a 15 million unit selling rate last month was actually very strong. That was a that was a, a good month. And in fact, we've seen some outperformance over the last two to three months in terms of vehicle sales. So we are taking heart with that. We have been bumping our forecast. Again, we're at 13.6 right now, added about 270,000 units to the forecast for this year. And I think we'll be bumping it again, uh, really more reflective of the August performance and what our expectation is going into September, October in particular. Uh, we've got some tight inventory, which we'll touch on, uh, but boy, uh, Folks are going out there and buying vehicles. It is a little counterintuitive given just how tough the situation is from an economic perspective, but maybe it's not all that counterintuitive when you think about how we're spending our money. You know, we're not going out as much. We're not uh, traveling as much. We, so we are, and we are saving in certain areas, but it's also giving us some cash flow for things like vehicle purchases. And if anybody's gone out to Home Depot trying to buy decking for their house or wood or whatever you'll see it's very uh, housing is very hot as well right now and home improvements and and so is auto, so are autos and we're seeing that on the used vehicle side as well used vehicle sales have, have really rebounded and used vehicle pricing has been very very strong so when you get used vehicle pricing being strong like that that creates a unique switching effect for new vehicle sales as well so we're watching for any risks that might might start to present themselves in the second half, but overall, uh, everything's been much more closely closely aligned to the positive. You flash forward to next year, we're roughly at about 14.8 million units. And again, I think there's gonna be some light upside to that as well. When you think about some of the return to market for some of these consumers as we've delayed some of the, um, the lease returns, we'll have some of those folks returning to market as well. So again, while we while we have seen a fair amount of volatility, we've also seen that volatility to the upside as it relates to the U.S. light vehicle sales environment. Now let's touch a little bit on scenarios before I go into production, because I, given how dramatic the decline was at the initial offset outset, and and just how variable things are around the virus and everything, we're big in considering uh, alternative planning scenarios. So here I've outlined a couple other ones. Our baseline, out, of course, is in there, and that is the green line, uh, and certainly detailed there. <clears throat> then I've got an optimistic and pessimistic scenario. Optimistic scenario is really about thinking about um, stimulus programs and really a return to market, if you will, by, by buyers at a much greater clip. You know, Again, that's what we talk about here with the vehicle buyer journey touching on that where folks are looking at their vehicle as a safe space and they, they're looking to enhance private car ownership, personal fleet, if you will, rather than relying on mass transit or again, those urban environments. And, and indeed, there's some, there's some upside potential from that perspective. When you look at our optimistic scenario, we see a return to 16 million units really at the latter part of next year going into 2022, maybe even a bit sooner. So getting a, getting a much more rapid return to normalcy on that front, Pessimistic scenarios all around the second wave, 
of the virus or an elongation of the current uh, situation that we're in. So thinking about more of a W-shaped uh, cycle and recovery. And that's where you see a, a selling rate of kind of a prolonged 14 million unit range for at least the next year or so, year, year and a half, 12 million units for this year. Um, you know, again, it, it would be much more of a, a fall off, if you will, and it'd be more indicative of, of the virus really kind of dictating the course as it were. Uh, but overall, right now, we've been uh, firing on many more cylinders than I think what was expected and, and much more indicative of at least elements of that optimistic forecast right now. From a production standpoint here, again, North American light vehicle production, that concept around huddling of the forecast more recently is certainly taking hold. We have made some upgrades to the forecast, even on a North America perspective. The, it is stunning to see when you look at between March and June, you know, US sales were about 4 million units or so, while production was only about 2.3 million. So we had this gap of about 1.6 million unit that really did absorb, was absorbed by inventory. So inventory is not an issue in terms of it being a negative by any stretch. It's a negative in the, in the sense that we may be tight on inventory and not able to get the right product in front of the right consumer right now. And that's why it's all about ramping up these plants. And by and large, most plants are running at, uh, I hesitate to say normal volumes because it is not a normal environment right now. We've got temperature checks, we've got you know social distancing within the plant, but it has been, really interesting to see and, and heartening to see the level at which automakers and I would even argue suppliers alike have really been able to respond and um, and execute in these cha in this challenging environment and I would say outperform to a great extent and that's really manifested here certainly in our production volumes we have again made some upgrades now at, at some point and I, and I say at some point because previously we were expecting kind of fourth quarter uh, to be that sort of um, reckoning, if you will, to between being able to produce and then producing to what that new level of demand is. So we sort of shifting gears maybe downward a little bit, downshifting into production somewhat. But I don't think we're going to do that nearly as much. I think that's going to be maybe more of a 2021 story. And it's not so much a contraction uh, of production by any means. In fact, we've got production going up next year. But in terms of that run rate, you know, start of a start, start uh, you know, rationalizing production in the face of inventory that may be building. Well, we're not expecting inventory to really be building all that significantly until now, probably closer to 2021. So that balancing out, if you will, is more likely than not going to be more of a 2021 story. And that's really manifest here. You can see here, our 2020 forecast is 12.8 million units for North American production. And again, that relative to our January forecast, that's where that red is, that sort of gap if you will. We were previously at about a 200,000 unit increase. That evaporated, certainly, um, and the, the virus really did kind of erase the outlook, as it were, and it really is more meaningfully impacting us this year and next year. Um, and again, that impact to next year may shave a little bit as well, because if we do see some improvement in the selling rate even going into next year, that's going to help work down some of that as well. You'll see that red as you go out further through our forecast horizon. That's more of a realignment in, in sales volumes, given some of the overhang as it relates to the economic environment and also um, you know, how that may crowd out some of those vehicle sales uh, in the intermediate to longer term. I will say that is becoming maybe more of a scenario than anything, because one of the other things that we are looking very closely at is what I alluded to in the optimistic scenario, to what extent we might see some de-urbanization actually supporting some incremental vehicle sales that might support production. I think there is some potential for that as well. But as of current time, we're currently looking at about 2024, returning to kind of 16 million unit levels of North American production. More of a U-shaped recovery, uh, U with maybe slight, uh, slightly V, uh, call it a Nike swoosh. Uh, it is interesting, during the 0809 timeframe, it took a good four or five years, probably closer to five years, to get back to kind of quote unquote normalized volumes. So I do think we'll get there maybe a little bit sooner this time around, uh, but it is still a little bit more of a process to be sure. Now a couple slides on a little more of the nitty gritty on production, when you look at North American production this year versus last year. And again, it's mostly red. I mean, other than Daimler with a little little bit here and there and in terms of some incremental volume. Uh, but that's indicative of just how impactful this has been across all automakers. And I would argue, it, to some extent, the Detroit 3 have actually weathered this a little better. And I think that's partly because of those 
segments that have been impacted the most and regions of the U.S. that have been impacted the most. If you look at where economies shut down on both coasts, the East Coast and West Coast, tended to be a little bit more aligned towards the German automakers, especially German luxury, and also the Asian automakers, whereas you look at Texas and the Midwest, did not necessarily fully shut down, and that tended to be a more aligned to pickup trucks, more aligned to D3. So we've seen some resiliency, especially near term, uh, recently, in terms of vehicle sales. So that certainly has helped. I'm sugarcoating it somewhat because it's still a three and a half million unit decline, but it is interesting to see how that's evolved things. We've seen product, certainly launches being impacted. I'll have a slide on that. We've seen some delays in vehicle launches um, that are factored certainly into our forecast. And those delays have really kind of pushed out and impacted our 2021 outlook. Now here you see, it's actually the flip. Flip side of the last slide, everything's, everything's growing for the exception of Daimler. Again, that's kind of, they were the ones growing lot for this year. Uh, so when you flash forward to next year, it's a little bit different. But uh, again, interesting here, the launch activity is not abating. It's shifting somewhat, to be sure. We've seen some delays, but there are some key, very key launches coming next year. Bronco and Maverick for Ford, great example, especially Bronco. Um, Grand Cherokee, and more importantly, perhaps Grand Wagoneer and Wagoneer. FCA showed the Wagoneer, uh, Grand Wagoneer this morning. Um, looks like a, It looks like it'll be a very good vehicle. Uh, well executed, uh, to be sure, and and then we've got a whole host of new domestic launches as well coming uh, coming down the pike next year, including some electrified vehicles, Lucid Air, the Rivian R1S and R1T, so so new EVs and certainly the Hummer EV as well. So this should be a pretty broad-based growth path in terms of still some strong truck offerings, a full year of F-150 as an example. And then also some new new alternative propulsion offerings as well, contributing to about 1.9 million units of production growth next year. Now, when you look at a production by country, some interesting things come up. Yeah, again, you see this year the, the, the immense cut that we've taken this year, obviously, is factored in here. My comparison on the right there really looks at it from 2019 to 2027 to kind of remove what is hopefully an anomaly. And, and you can see here, we do look for about 670,000 units of growth in terms of the U.S. production uh, between 19 and 2027. So again, we got a new plant for Mazda and Toyota in, uh, in Alabama. We've got some new capacity, some new incremental capacity coming online in, North, in the U.S. as well. Uh, even in, even in uh, Mexico, we've got about 90,000 units of growth. One thing that hasn't changed a whole lot is the contraction we are still expecting in Canada. We've got a big uh, Canadian Auto Workers Union negotiation with the D3 going on actually right now. So that may help fine tune some of this, but in terms of overall de productive demand, most of that's gonna be coming from the US and then to an extent Mexico, which certainly does support the case for production here in North America. Now here we take a look at production by automaker type and a couple themes kick in. One thing I, I, I've been quick to note is last year, and it doesn't probably get enough uh, enough news. Last year was the first year that the transplant automakers actually equaled the Detroit Three. We saw parity in terms of North American production, and really that majority status is going to shift to the transplant automakers going forward. And it's not so much of a uh, indictment of the Detroit Three by any stretch. <clears throat> and in fact, the production they do have left is going to be sizable in its own right and should be more profitable for them as well. And it's really more of a measure of more localization on the part of the transplant automakers. Expansion in that category, you see the light blue there, those are the uh, the new uh, new energy vehicle, EV startups, so Tesla's still certainly in there, Rivian is in there, um, certainly Lucid Air as well. There's some other new intenders we haven't fully, fully added to the forecast yet. We're always looking at that closely to adding that, but there is a lot of activity in the EV space, even here in the North American and US market. Uh, certainly a lot of it going on in Europe and China, which we'll see in a moment, but certainly a lot going on in the US as well. Now, from a, from a vehicle launch timing perspective, I wanted to include this because so much of the news is absorbed by volumes, you know, how much we're down for the month, how much we're gonna be down for the year, but what doesn't get talked about in the press nearly as much are vehicle delays. And frankly, that can be as impactful to a supplier, if not more impactful than volumes at times. Uh, and when you look at it here, we've seen a lot of shifting in vehicle program timings. Here, this looks at North American vehicle launches, specifically uh, when we think about all new or major 
uh, redesigns. And you look at in red down below is what the number of launches that were in our January forecast, again, versus where we currently see the market. And you can see we went from 34 vehicles to be launched this year to 23. You look at next year, we actually boost, we come up a little bit because we've seen some delays. We've seen some further out, some vehicles that have been further delayed further out as well. Some that have been shifted, we're gonna be produced here, gonna be produced elsewhere as well. So all of this has been kind of operating kind of below the surface. A big takeaway here is as some of those vehicle programs get delayed, we haven't seen as many, I would argue, outright cancellations, but certainly a lot of focused delays and going out to 2023 and 2024 are going to be a, a pretty big cycle in terms of uh, vehicle redesigns. And we're finally starting to see maybe a little bit of um, a huddling on that front as well, a little bit slowing of the volatility and delays. We'll always see vehicle delays, but at this, by the same token, it's starting to settle down somewhat. Um, we've got a lot of battery electric vehicle activity coming down the pike as well. Not, not as many cancellations as you might think, given that it's kind of a high tech, higher tech uh, vehicle launches, but some delays to be sure. Uh, but by, by and large, most automakers are holding to their launch cadence as it relates to battery electric. So uh, we're not seeing automakers letting up on the, uh, letting up on the development all that much at all. If, if, you know, if anything, they're, they're remaining steadfast in their commitment towards battery electric. Um, we're going to have to dig, we're going to have to bring the consumer along on this journey, but the, the BEV vehicles are coming and they're coming with a vengeance over the next few years. And that really is dovetailing in real with this slide and one of my last slides. Take a look at the powertrain technology outlook. US, EU28, so Europe and China. And, and again, the US looks a lot different than Europe and China in terms of those pie charts production, or in this case, it's sales by propulsion type. You know, it's a, it is much more of a battery electric and, and plug-in hybrid story in Europe and China, especially out to 2025, but we are growing. We're definitely growing in terms of, in terms of driving uh, additional uptake in the U.S. in 2025. So we are baking that into the forecast. Um, what is also factored in here down below is in these line charts. So here we take a look at what our EV and hybrid forecast is, call it market share, if you will, uh, both pre-COVID and post. So H2 of 2019, what that forecast reading was, and then H1 of 2020. And some interesting developments, especially in the US. We've staged out a little bit of that uh, battery electric uptake or, or adoption, if you will, in the immediate time period because of low gas prices um, and frankly, some delays in vehicle launches, things like that but we've actually increased it uh, in the most recent forecast as you get out to 2022 and beyond. And part of that is because of some more vehicles that are being launched um, into more mainstream segments as well. And the expectations, I think we will start to see a little bit more broader uh, consumer adoption in that intermediate to longer term. You look at the EU28, um, we have not seen any major changes to CO2 compliance regulations. So I think the, most of those electrified propulsion investments are going to be safe. And, and in fact, they're doubling down on those. Um, we're seeing government stimulus actually in, embracing and supporting um, battery electric vehicle and hybrid vehicle demand. So that's actually helped uh, maybe those, those vehicles outperform even right now as we speak and, and, and in the near to intermediate term as well. And in China, we've extended some of those uh, new energy vehicle subsidies so we haven't seen maybe as much pre-buying in 2020, but it should definitely help support demand in 2021 and 2022. So the government is playing a big role in helping to drive uh, demand, both in Europe and in China. The US is gonna be a little bit TBD. We've got a new election coming up in November. It could shake things up completely in terms of CAFE versus the new SAFE Act. But by, by the same token, it, the consumer is in a different place here in the US certainly than, than what we see in Europe and in China at present. And finally, got one more slide here. Just take a look at mobility. Here we look at mobility under three sort of, call it three pillars, if you will. A automation, so fully autonomous vehicles versus you know L2, L3, sort of semi-autonomous. Ownership, do you personally own it or is it like mobility as a service, ride sharing, car, car ride hailing, car sharing, and then propulsion, electric vehicle, internal combustion and how those three pillars really do come together and work in a cohesive bond over the years. And that is largely still borne out and we still do expect it to, to kind of occur in that process. But each one of those legs is, is, is operating differently. 
And that's really what we see here right now. We see electrification. Uh, we're actually seeing some acceleration in, in electrification right now. And that's an interesting dynamic, especially in Europe and Asia. Again, as I mentioned before, Europe and China is actually accelerating. And I think we'll start to see that in the US. Uh, ownership is different. You know, ride hailing and car sharing, if you look at Uber and Lyft, is challenging. We're not seeing, um, you know, we're not seeing the riding, the ridership increasing at all. In fact, we've seen it decline significantly. Um, it's starting to come back slight, slowly, but they are moving a lot of product. You know, DoorDash, um, you know, Postmates, Uber Eats has all been very active. Vehicle miles traveled is going to be important to watch here. So vehicle miles traveled in terms of work from home is a big factor as well. We we work, commuting is about 34% of our vehicle miles traveled in the US. So the more we work from home, it's gonna be a little bit of a headwind to vehicle utilization. But by the same token, the, the de-urbanization we might see in some of these major metropolitan areas, whether it be not using public transport, transportation as much, or moving your household out of the densely populated areas towards more of the suburban areas is certainly an enabler, a support mechanism to personal vehicle ownership. So again, there's puts and takes there. In terms of uh, long-term uh, fully autonomous vehicles, boy, we're seeing automakers and, and the tech players really recalibrating maybe some of their expectations on that front. I would argue we've been a little bit more realistic on that in talking about 2035, 2040 and beyond. But I'll tell you, L2 and L3, which are kind of the semi-autonomous, um, the the driver assist type systems are still very hot in, in operating on all, firing on all cylinders right now. And it's, there's a lot of activity going on that front. And then with that, just one last slide to wrap it up. Again, it, it's kind of cliche at this point. Volatility is, is you know, has definitely emerged and is, is the biggest impact on us in the near term. And, and we are starting to see some supplier distress that we're going to have to continue to keep our eyes on. But once we get beyond this current cycle, um, we do see growth rates declining as a whole. But boy, opportunities in the area of electrification, safety, and even autonomous and no, new mobility are certainly, um, we do expect to see those opportunities continue to, to resound and rebound as well. Uh, scale is always important. FCA and PSA are great examples on an automaker's perspective, but we don't think it's not the be all end all. You know, just a simple merger and acquisition is the be all and end all. I think, frankly, we're going to see more and more strategic collaboration. We saw it today GM had a big announcement with Honda. I think that's a great example at an OEM level. Um, we see very similar examples at, at the supplier level, both in terms of MA and collaboration. And I think we're going to see more and more of that to help kind of balance out the amount of investment that's going to need, be needed in this industry, whether it be related to electrification or autonomous, or even some of the, uh, you know, again, the uh, the new mobility trends as well. With that, I will turn it back over to uh, Beth and then for eventually for a Q&A at the end of the event. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, and by the way, both Mike and Max's PowerPoints will be available on our website as well as the recording. So you will be able to take a look at those. And boy, Mike, you started, you know, I was getting very depressed at the beginning because you're talking about, you know, this recession worse than 2008 and such. And, but then you ended up positive that, you know, things are looking up. Some of our numbers are looking up and we're going to see some positive. And by the way, I am, my next car has got it. It's going to be electric. I mean, look at your numbers, and if it's more accessible, that's the direction I'm going. So I'm looking for ideas of what to buy, guys. Um, with that, I'm going to turn over to um, turn this over to Max Newman. Uh, Max is a shareholder, but so long, and he's one of my go-to guys when people say, "Hey, I have this guy who owes me, you know, forty thousand or three hundred thousand." And um, I'm getting really nervous about this customer because he's not paying me or I'm having problems with um, just meeting my payroll, let alone, let alone paying my suppliers. And I want to pay my suppliers so I keep getting, you know, what I need to produce and pay my bills. And so I'm getting a lot of questions right now with people who are nervous and asking me about, you know, what are the signs of bankruptcy? Either, you know, for me, should I be considering it? 
or should I be really worried about this customer of mine and what can I do to protect myself? And so, especially of late, I mean, yesterday, today, I've been feel, fielding a lot of those questions and trying to respond. And as I said, Max is one of my go-to people. And because of the increase in these inquiries um, a couple of weeks ago, that's why we thought, Matt, we gotta get Max to uh, give you guys some free advice right now so you can see them. And then when you do see the problem, pick up the phone and give us a call so we can help you through this, you know, difficult time. And, and with that, Max, the brain and financial crisis and restructuring, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Beth. And uh, I hope everyone can, can hear me all right. Uh, I really appreciate speaking to you today. Um, and I really appreciated hearing from Mike, uh, um, you know, better a, a Nike swoosh shape recovery than a W um, or, uh, you know, something worse than that. Um, I lived through 2008, 2009, and uh, I, uh, even though they were profitable years for me, that is not really what I'm looking for uh, again. I have been doing uh, bankruptcy law now for 26 years. I started with a uh, firm that uh, did a lot of debtors work. Um, and before the crisis in 2008, 2009, I realized that the action uh, was in, in Michigan at least was going to be on the supplier and customer side and joined Butts along where I've been uh, since that date. Um, and I think it is useful. I'm going to start the presentation really with a lot of focus on the debtor side as I started my career, in fact. Uh, but I, I think it is really useful to do that because when you know what debtors can do and what their objectives are in the bankruptcy code, it's easier, even if you are on the other side, to formulate uh, your objectives and to react to uh, um, the things that they are doing. I did put a slide in here on on the background uh, uh when this crisis started uh i think uh, most most insolvency professionals were expecting a tsunami of bankruptcy cases and if i were in the in energy hospitality or retail sectors i would be feeling that manufacturing has had a few uh, cases uh the shiloh case out of um, filed in Delaware, but out of Michigan is, is the most recent uh, and a pretty significant automotive supplier. Uh, but it hasn't been remotely what 2008 and 2009 is like. I think a lot of that is uh, people are waiting on resolution of government aid, the PPP loans, and other inflection points, uh, depending on the, the shape of the recovery. Uh, may impact uh, the number of insolvency filings and uh, any issues that arrive there. We're still expecting a, a wave of bankruptcy. It may be a high tide. It may be a, a tsunami. I haven't uh, heard yet, and I apologize. Uh, somehow, I'm trying. I'm connected through my phone, and the do not disturb function on my phone has has failed me. So um, I will. If, if there are any interruptions, I will get rid of those as, as, as quickly as possible. Um, chapter 11, there are many ways to deal with a business in, in an insolvency situation. Uh, chapter 11 is the most complex and legal process, but there can be far less extreme measures, uh, starting with a forbearance agreement with lenders to stock sales, asset sales outside of the court. Um, there are many different ways of self-liquidating. Uh, there are ways to create agreements between the company and all of its creditors, all of its trade creditors, outside of a court process. Um, there are th state law processes like appointment of receivers, state law insolvency re remedies. Conceptually, Aside from things like forbearance agreements, which are just contractual arrangements with uh, secured creditors, um, conceptually, most of these processes are the same. So I'm going to try to cover it under the umbrella of Chapter 11. But it's important to remember that there are many, many ways that 
that your customers and suppliers or even your company itself may may try to deal with this and that the in court process is only one of those ways um, in addition i will also uh, briefly address a concept that really is focused on the automotive industry more than more than any other which are accommodation agreements access and security agreements and some other auto industry related concerns uh, because of the just-in-time inventory system, which um, is used is used everywhere now, but is most intensely used, I think, in the automotive industry or the defense industry, uh, there are some unique ways that customers try to protect their production, even in a bankruptcy, that are, that it is important to address. And somehow I have temporarily lost control of the slides so Jonathan if if you don't mind advancing oh and I regained it and and now uh, advanced it several at a time so Max which slide would you like to be on um, I think that the downside slides I think the one that I'm on right right now is uh, is, is well let's see now back let's back it up a little um okay so just very quickly through this one um chapter 11 is uh, a flexible process that is uh permits individuals and businesses to restructure their liabilities it the first uh three or four items are reasons that a company may file bankruptcy the last four items are things that you can do in bankruptcy. You may file a bankruptcy to halt creditor action, to create a breathing spell to examine some of your business options, to maintain control over the business, um, but to enhance management with financial professionals um, and, and advisors, and to settle longstanding and expensive litigation. What you can achieve through bankruptcy is you can establish terms of a long-term payout to creditors, you can reorganize business operations on an operational, financial, or structural uh, uh, basis, you can sell all or part of a company in bulk, and you can liquidate uh, the company in an orderly manner if that's the appropriate solution. Almost every type of business can file Chapter 11, individuals can as well, and it's an important point an individual or business does not need to be insolvent to file bankruptcy. There are times where a business that can see the future coming is better off filing uh, bankruptcy before uh, the situation gets worse, um, especially when you see uh, the downhill slope on, on production. Um, it's rare that I would recommend a solvent business uh, file bankruptcy, but it's, it's, it's not a never. Um, there are a lot of downsides to Chapter 11 and to any of the other bankruptcy processes that, that I mentioned. Uh, cost is a problem. Limitation on time periods. You don't have forever once you file bankruptcy. And I always tell clients that bankruptcy days are dog's years. Each day in a bankruptcy ages a company about seven years. So the faster you get through a bankruptcy, the better. But at the same time, you, you are going to need some time to address the complex economic and structural issues that led to a bankruptcy. And going back to Mike's presentation for a moment, when you come out of bankruptcy, it, it would sure be nice to come out of it onto the upside of a Nike swoosh rather than the downside of a W. Because uh, once you get through the bankruptcy, you're going to... Uh, uh, really need uh, uh, the, the sales and support that uh, you get from a growing economy. Um, you lose flexibility. Uh, very importantly, you lose business opportunities when you are in uh, a bankruptcy situation. It is rare but not unheard of for companies in Chapter 11 to be given new and long-term business programs. Um, finally, you lose some independence. The case is supervised by the court, um, and 
if things go wrong once you're in a bankruptcy, uh, you can lose control and even the best laid plans uh, can fall apart. Uh, if people remember the Delphi bankruptcy in the in the early 2000s, uh, they had a absolutely brilliant plan. It was going to pay creditors essentially in full, and it was going to rescue the business. Um, and it took some time to implement. And by the time they were ready to implement the plan, the Great Recession hit. Uh, the purchasers of the company and backers of the companies pulled out and uh, Delphi wound up uh, paying only a small distribution to creditors um, and suing everyone for uh, preference claims. So um, I can't emphasize enough that A, the black swan events can impact uh, a bankruptcy case that's already pending and B, um, speed in resolving issues is is critically impro important. Um, the the next item is uh, a new a new twist to the bankruptcy code, something that wasn't around uh, in the last economic crisis, um, and it's something that the the law on is still developing even even today. Uh, in 2019, Congress passed what's called the Small Business Reorganization Act, which provided for a faster and less costly version of Chapter 11 for smaller businesses. When they passed it, they really focused it on small businesses. It was only for businesses with undisputed non-contingent liabilities of less than 2.7 and some change uh, million in liabilities. Um, that would not affect most manufacturing concerns. Um, however, with the COVID crisis, they upped the debt limit uh, for a year uh, up to seven and a half million dollars, which enormously expands uh, the number of businesses that can uh, benefit from the SBRA. Uh, and what the SBRA does is it appoints a trustee with, with certain duties um, but it also shortens deadlines and eliminates a lot of the issues in the plan confirmation process that would have added cost and delay to uh, small business debtors. So I wouldn't say it's 100% of businesses under the debt limit that would benefit from the small business treatment, but certainly a high percentage of them would uh, it would reduce the transactional costs of the bankruptcy, and it would simplify a lot of the plan issues that can bedevil um, larger companies or um, even smaller companies in, in previous bankruptcies. What a lot of practitioners, including myself, have said over the years is that the issues are the same in a small business case as they are often in a large business case. Um, the difference being that the small business case can't afford to throw lawyers and financial consultants at those issues. Congress at least has recognized that um, and, and provided some relief. So the next uh, few slides are going to address some of the key concepts in uh, Chapter 11 cases. The important thing to note in these is traditional Chapter 11 and the SBRA have not changed most of these concepts other than uh, the ultimate disclosure statement and the plan. And uh, before I hit uh, these slides, I will say that in any Chapter 11 circumstance, whether you are the debtor or a creditor, or supplier or a customer, it is critical in advance to set your objectives and to try to figure out an exit plan doesn't mean as a, as say a customer that you need to exit from the bankruptcy cut bank excuse me the bankrupt company what it does mean is that you need to set your objectives on what you would like the relationship to look like at the end of the case um and game planning uh i think is is really where uh, specialized counsel can can assist you, specialized financial advisors, whichever side of the case you're on. And, and I cannot stress enough the, the importance of, uh, of of having a good game plan 
and having the flexibility to adjust it when things go wrong. So bankruptcy starts with the automatic stay. The automatic stay essentially blocks creditor actions against the debtor. There are a number of ex exceptions to it. Um, companies that want to uh, themselves to be an exception to the automatic stay can seek relief from but essentially uh, it is uh, a, a way of blocking most actions that could interfere with the business operations of a company and as I mentioned before uh, it allows the company a breathing space to take action to correct itself. The debtor in possession. Unlike almost every other country, um, the United States allows existing management of a company that, that brought it into bankruptcy uh, to control the company during bankruptcy. Um, depending on, on the management, of course, this can be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but it does allow the people who are most familiar with the company and its operations to have their shot at trying to fix the problems. Uh, generally, existing management would only be removed for serious misconduct, bad acts in connection with the case, or gross incompetence. But one thing that can be done in, in a Chapter 11 to bolster management is the hiring of financial advisors or a concept that you may have heard of called chief restructuring officers which is essentially the appointment of an individual experienced in bankruptcy matters to uh, be the final arbiter of decisions that are critical to the restructuring. Um, one of the primary benefits of the debtor in possession is the exclusive ability to file a plan. This puts them in control of the negotiation and direction of the case. Uh, it's always in place for the first 120 days subject again to adjustment if the court uh, thinks management is abusing that position uh, and for the good cause that time period can be extended by another 16 months i went i mentioned the delphi case before that 16 month deadline is new um, the delphi case uh, really persisted um, with the debtor in possession having control of the plan for probably around three or four years. Um, that doesn't exist anymore. The case may last that long, but um, other voices can be heard from long before that time period. Just very briefly, um, creditors get a voice in, in the operations and financial restructuring of a business in Chapter 11. One way this happens is that creditors committees may be formed. They are picked from amongst the largest creditors. The office of the U.S. trustee, a government office, takes efforts to make sure that uh, the creditors committees are representative of the uh, creditors of the estate. They have the ability to appear on and be heard in any issue in the case, but their purpose really is to negotiate the terms of a plan with the debtor. When things go wrong, they also investigate whether claims exist against any party, including former and current owners and officers of the debtor. As I mentioned, uh, one of the uh, downsides of bankruptcy for a company is a loss of privacy. Um, to some extent, filing a bankruptcy is almost like hiring somebody to investigate the decisions you've made in your business uh, for some period of time. Hopefully that isn't, isn't a concern, but I don't think anybody likes ha having people look over their shoulder. Someday I'll get good at controlling the slides. I apologize uh, uh, if I'm giving anybody whiplash with my uh, back and forth. Um, in a bankruptcy case, you need the use of, of, of your money. Um, except in very rare cases, there will be secured claims as to accounts receivable, inventory, and cash on hand. Except in very rare cases, the company will need to use those or to obtain financing. In bankruptcy, that can only be done with court permission. Um, they have to provide protection to other secured creditors. Uh, they cannot obtain a new loan or draw upon an existing loan without the permission of the court. Um, 
and typically this happens within the first two or three days of a case, subject to later adjustment as um, as the case continues. Uh, there are incentives in bankruptcy to permit what are called dip lenders or post-bankruptcy financing lenders to get enhanced priorities so that uh, they're actually willing to make loans to companies in bankruptcy. Um, in order to do that, though, you need to make sure that, that your pre-petition bankruptcy, excuse me, your pre-petition lender is not getting worse off during the course of the bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is also an excellent forum for asset sales. Bankruptcy courts can give title free and clear of liens, claims, and interest, which uh, is often described as the best title a buyer can get. Giving that sort of title can also cut down on a buyer's uh, financial due diligence. Uh, they don't have to be concerned about the scope of a lender's lien or security interests of uh, some equipment lenders or, or anything like that because they can get a court order that says that they have good title to the assets. Um, you can sell, you know, one machine to everything in a bankruptcy case. Uh, they can include substantially all of the operating assets of a business or division of the business, and they may be the exit strategy for a business. Uh, GM and Chrysler appeared to continue after their bankruptcies, but in reality, they had these types of asset sales, and the GM that exists today is a different legal entity than the GM that existed before 2005, or 2009, excuse me. Um, you can rush a going concern sale if you need to, if you have a compelling reason to rush it. The average process would take around 90 days or more. Uh, there's no set requirements for a, a bankruptcy sale, but it's common to uh, have an agreement with an initial buyer called a stalking horse and to permit other potential buyers to submit higher and better offers after access to due diligence. The stalking horse often gets uh, protection uh, and reimbursement of, of fees and, and otherwise um, in order to encourage them to, to go in first. Chapter 11 from <clears throat> a competitor or a supplier or even a customer can provide an opportunity uh, if uh, you are interested in exploring the purchase of, of that competitor, customer, or supplier. Um, and uh, uh, it is important to think when you're considering uh, end objectives to a uh, Chapter 11 case, whatever position you're in, whether an asset sale is something that you might be interested in. Um, leases, uh, I really am gonna give people whiplash, I apologize. Leases and executory contracts. Uh, the company in a bankruptcy, the debtor in a bankruptcy can reject bad supply contracts um, from either the customer or uh, uh, supplier basis. Um, and usually the court will accept their judgment. They, you know, if they say, if someone is producing for you and they tell you that they're producing at a loss uh, and that they're going to reject the contract, you may have what, what you feel are compelling economic arguments to force them to continue to produce it is very rare that uh, in that situation that you are successful in avoiding the rejection of a contract. Sometimes, and, and, and not always, but sometimes you can continue interim production for long enough to permit a orderly resourcing. But generally the court will follow the debtor's directives with respect to uh, rejecting executory contracts. Uh, they can also do the same thing with, with leases. Um, the, as, I, as I mentioned, the ability to reject contracts is a powerful incentive to renegotiate in contracts. If your supplier comes to you uh, and says they're going to file Chapter 11 and reject your contract, it is uh, worth the time to, to listen and consider whether there are ways to resolve the situation either through a an interim agreement and a resourcing, 
or through some sort of price increase or other economic relief. Um, this next page I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. The disclosure statement was is a part of a traditional bankruptcy case. It is not part of an SBRA case. Um, the disclosure statement is similar to a securities prospectus. It is supposed to give detailed financial information about a company, past and present, and provide creditors with enough information about the finances of the company, its outlook, and the plan itself in order for them to make an informed decision on the plan. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the disclosure statement has become less important over the years. Um, it is now sometimes very quickly passed over by, by bankruptcy courts. Uh, but it is something that also uh, winds up creating a great deal of cost for the debtor in its production. Um, if, you, if you're doing the job the right way and giving somebody really a securities prospectus, I think many of us know how much that process can cost. The plan is the cornerstone of the case. The plan can simply be an asset sale. Um, it can follow an asset sale with liquidation, or it can be a full-scale reorganization of the company um, in whatever form that may ultimately take. I mentioned the, the GM and Chrysler bankruptcies <clears throat> and that there were asset sales in connection with those cases. There were also ultimately plans which set up creditor trust and liquidated assets of, of GM and uh, and Chrysler that uh, it's the creditors no or excuse me that the companies no longer wish to keep. Uh, there are a lot of provisions in the plan that impact the ability to uh, confirm the plan over the objection of creditors. If confirmed, the plan is a binding contract between the company and its creditors over the future of the company. Um, the plan must be accepted by half a number and two thirds of dollar amount of all claims that vote on it, or each class of claims that vote on it. It must be feasible. And if certain, there are certain provisions that happen if a class of creditors reject the plan. Um, one of those that is, that is very important for people who are attempting to maintain control of a company is that if a class of unsecured creditors rejects the plan, equity cannot retain their ownership or interest without effectively buying them back. There are many ways that that process can occur, but again, it's a complication, it's a risk of a loss of control, and it is a significant risk factor in a bankruptcy. Under the SBRA, that last factor is no longer the case. You no longer need acceptance of a plan by an impaired class of creditors. You no longer need to avoid distributions to lower priority interest holders, including equity holders. What you do need to do in a SBRA plan is to provide for all net disposable income, which is based on projected income and expenses for three to five years to be distributed to secured and unsecured creditors. So the business's projections of its operations for three to five years after the case are critical. Um, you know, are small businesses capable of providing accurate projections of, of what will really happen over the next three to five years? I think we can see even on a global basis with uh, the COVID recession that nobody is capable of really Meeting that, meeting that standard, and the hope is that the SBRA will be flexible enough to allow adjustments uh, to plans, um, either when business circumstances are below what a debtor had projected or above. But because the act is new, we're still working through uh, how it will all work in practice. feel like I hit the button again. Let's see. Okay. 
Um, all right. So that's really covering a lot of the debtor side. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on on the creditor side, and cre and this is both for suppliers and customers. First of all, I wanted to mention detecting insolvency. Whether it's a supplier or a customer, um, this is obviously crucial. There's no magic formula. Um, you know, key is the regular communication between management, credit, and sales. The more, uh, the further in advance you can plan for an insolvency, the better. And things to look for: payment delays, management changes, uh, employment of consultants, lack of communication. If a public company is your supplier or your customer, if there are delays in the filing of financial reports that are unexplained, if they are building banks or if they are slowing production, if there's cancellation or delay of new programs or new orders um, on e up and down the supply chain, you will see disruptions. Um, layoffs and departures, rumors are always uh, very, very important. Um, considerations in dealing with insolvent companies, you gotta set your objectives for the relationship. Are you willing to invest something in the supply chain, the party in the supply chain relationship? If you're a supplier to them, are you willing to give them longer credit terms? If you are a customer to them, are you willing to give them shorter credit terms? What's the risk of the strategy's failure? What is your company's relationship? Are you 50% of the business? Are you 25% of the business? Are you a nominal portion of the business? All of that will impact uh, the considerations in, in dealing with insolvent companies up and down the supply chain. Negotiations are key. Documenting the workout are, uh, is key. And as I mentioned before, there's accommodation agreements, access agreements, security agreements. There's participations uh, if um, you need to become a uh, short-term lender to your customer. Uh, there are sometimes times when it's very important to have agreements between yourself and other customers. Uh, you need to be careful with those so you don't uh, in have antitrust concerns, uh, but it may be critical to, to ensure that your competitors are also paying their fair share of the costs of uh, protecting against an insolvent supplier. Um, you need to think about whether you want the debtor to go into court and whether any support that you provide to them uh, works best in court. Uh, I think number five on that page is, is really important. Uh, you need to treat the problem of an insolvent customer or supplier as you would a crisis in your own operations with a SWAT team consisting of representatives from various parts of uh, your organization. You know, that's um, a for point number five, Max, and I just, uh, I don't want to cut you off too short on this because We've had a lot of questions already on what to do when we detect insolvency or we're worried about it. But we've got 15 more minutes, and I want to save time for Q&A. So um, if you can wrap this up in like five minutes, that would be helpful. I, I absolutely will, and I always appreciate uh, when I am told not to be long-winded. Um, there are some suppliers, and you, you, there are some additional slides and you will receive the uh, the deck um, from Jonathan uh, about considerations for suppliers pre-bankruptcy, um, things that you can do such as stopping delivery on shipments in progress and altering terms. Um, I cannot stress enough the point to get the money. Even if you're later exposed to clawback from a bankruptcy estate, it is far better to have the money in your position, possession um, and carefully track POs. Um, usually the best result in a bankruptcy case for a supplier is to have their contract assumed. This not only protects them against the preference risk I just mentioned, but also requires the debtor to cure all arrearages and provide assurance of future performance. Uh, it's within the debtor's discretion. There is nothing you can do to, to force it other than through negotiation. 
Um, considerations for customer pre-bankruptcy, you need to identify the troubled suppliers as early as possible. Um, you know, there's a similar list of signs of distress that we went over before, uh, so I won't won't reiterate those, those points. Um, well, one thing I did mention there that I think is important is watch to see if they've shifted resources towards other customers. Uh, that's something that really needs to be gar guarded against. For customers, you need to consider whether you you desperately need the supplier to remain in place or whether you can exit. Uh, we list some of the key factors in uh, that a customer will consider when exiting. Uh, and, you know, if you cannot exit, do you need to make accommodations to the supplier if short terms or long? If so, you need to fill the gaps that you need, whether it, whether it is ownership of tooling, a mandate for the sale of the company, options to purchase equipment, or even a security interest for access. That leads to the last topic, accommodation agreements, which are agreements that say, I'm going to provide a supplier of mine with X, Y, and Z consideration, shortened terms, even loans, um, in exchange for protecting my position so that I can resource and make sure that there is not a disruption in my supply chain. And with that, um, I very quickly got through that last portion. Thank you, Beth. And uh, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, thank you, appreciate it. Well, we have a number of different questions and um, I wanna hit one first for Mike. And that question, and the reason why I like this question is because it reminds me of uh, a question from March. And in March, the question was, you know, people are going to be flying less. Do you see, how do you see rentals going? Because people aren't on business trips as much, so will rentals go down? Or will people do more road trips because they don't want to be on planes? So will rentals go up? And what kind of impact will that be? So that was a question I asked you back in March. And this question that somebody's asking now is how much of the reduction in the sales forecast is caused by low demand in fleet sales? So maybe you can combine those two thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I should have given a little bit more coverage in my in my talking points when I was going through because fleet the fleet side of the equation has been impacted the most during all of this, interestingly enough. And and again, this is another unique characteristic versus the Great Recession. Again, um, you flash forward now, nobody's flying or very few are flying, very few are, are renting vehicles right now. And you've seen obviously Hertz file. Uh, file chapter 11, and, and, and we've seen the other uh, rental companies largely bagging off on, on buying new vehicles right now, and that is a huge impact. So just to give some folks some, some numbers around this, last year, 17 million units, roughly 17, 17.1 million units was what we sold total in the U.S. Of that, about 2.1 million was daily rental. That was just daily rental. The, the fleet category is roughly about 2.8 million or so, 2.7, 2.8. So you can see that uh, the significant majority of fleet sales are daily rental. So to Beth, most specifically your point, we see daily rental as being significantly impacted this year. So uh, again, obviously retail has been impacted, but not nowhere near to the degree that we've seen it on the fleet side. And, and as it relates to daily rental, whereas last year we were, again, roughly around 2.1 million, you look at this year, we're probably going to be around 900,000 units or so, maybe a little higher if we see at the very tail end of the year some of the uh, daily rental uh, firms coming back into market just to replenish their fleet. But so much of this is going to be dictated by, again, for the cliche of the day, the virus, and, and more importantly, how that impacts airfare, or I'm sorry, air travel and travel in general along those lines. Um, some slight good news to this is we are starting to see some signs and we saw it in August, a little bit of improvement on the commercial on the commercial fleet side for sure, but fleet in general, we're starting to see a little bit of improved performance in fleet, but I do think that's mainly more aligned towards government and commercial fleet. Daily rental is still a tough, tough market right now. Okay, thank you. Also, um, you know, one of the other questions is, 
Will overcapacity in light of vehicle production drive cost upward? Um, are there other inefficiencies? How much of that impact? How much? How might that impact and vehicle pricing? Yeah, that's it's a great question, and it, and it really is going to depend depend on the market to some extent, and by by the region we're talking about in Europe. Uh, I do think I think overcapacity is is even more problematic in Europe than say North America as an example. So I do think there's going to be some pressure there. Uh, China capacity is this really kind of nebulous creature over in China because if you're a, a foreign JV, uh, utilization tends to be stronger than uh, say the domestic brands. So there's a there's a lot of fragmentation in China, and then we need to see some consolidation. So I think that's sort of ever present. In North America, and that may be the more importantly the vein of this question, North America in particular, yes, as it relates to how far we've come down this year, utilization is going to be much lower than a, a quote-unquote traditional year. Uh, we should start to see that improve again as the year closes, as we go into next year. So there will be something of a headwind uh, in terms of call it cost, in terms of uh, uh, you know pricing to that extent and, and, and frankly we're going to see pricing pressures I think intensify particularly as we kind of progress through this but I, I think the the pricing pressure is probably even more so related to content what we're seeing in terms of moving towards more electrified vehicles that is going to add even even more pressure on pricing and that is frankly what's maybe putting a tempering us a little bit more on our enthusiasm in terms of you know, again, returning to 17 million units plus. I think there is going to be some limitations we're going to expect um, in the new vehicle market because of some of that pricing pressure um, within the market. And we see it, you know, every day as we see some of these new vehicles launching, uh, you know, the, the pricing is is escalating at a, at a very rapid clip and is going to have something of a limiting factor to the market. Thank you. So does that mean I might not be able to afford my electric car? You bring no. a checkbook. If you bring a checkbook, <laughs> they'll they'll sell you one, and there will be a lot to choose from for sure. <laughs> Great. Um, the next question is for Max, and actually, I've got two kind of opposite end questions on this. The first one is: is uh, Tier One Auto Company owes me some owes us money. Uh, they say they'll make payments. I'm worried they'll go bankrupt. How do I protect myself? And then the other question related to the clawback comment that you made earlier. So I guess first let's say if I'm the one that's owed money, how do I protect, how do I get the money and protect myself? So, yeah, so the, I mean, the first rule is get the money. Um, in other words, take any payment, even if you're worried about later clawback of the payment, even if it was, um, absolutely a situation where the payment could later be clawed back. Worst case scenario is that you would only have to give back a percentage of it. You are always better off getting the money. Second thing, um, as a supplier to, to a company having trouble, your remedies are largely on the future side, not on the past. Um, in other words, you're better off stopping shipments and trying to alter credit terms based on lack of adequate assurance of future performance than you are in filing lawsuits and trying to collect on past dues. If you can give discounts to get money in, great. Um, if you can leverage any other sort of commercial pressure to get past due money in, great. Um, but a lot of the times I like to sort of adopt the Hippocratic oath of make things no worse. Make sure that if you're continuing to supply to them that you get paid on either shorter terms, cash in advance terms, whatever you can possibly get to maximize uh, the level of recovery before the bankruptcy case down, goes down the road. On the preference side, um, you know, once once a company is in sort, you know, could file bankruptcy anytime within the next 90 days, there isn't really much you can do to protect yourself. If you can are in a position where you can hold them to terms so that they're paying uh, amounts in a form and in a time frame 
that is similar to what they've done during the history of the relationship between the parties, you you are far better off. Uh, but again, that may be an impossible thing to do uh, in, a, in an insolvency situation, and it may conflict with goals that you'll have at the same time of of trying to maximize the recovery. Uh, again, I err on in favor of of getting the money, holding the money. Not every bankruptcy case files preference suits, um, and almost every preference to, suit can be settled for less than 100 cents on the dollar, and sometimes far, far less than 100 cents on the dollar. So I, I hope that it's helpful. I, I am well aware of the limitations of, of that advice, and I wish there was something I could tell you that was that was more of, of a magic bullet. They but just want but. Trying yeah. to trying to be realistic. Yeah, they just want their money and want it fast, and they don't want to have to pay it back. So I think yep. that's that's the message with that one. Um, the next one is, um, and I guess this is um, Max for for you is how can a company formulate an exit strategy? Um and. So you can answer this sort of through the debtor or for a supplier or a customer. Um, and each of them has, has different areas. It's one reason why I, I recommend forming the SWAT team internally of um, the varying divisions who can have input. Because if it's somebody on your supply chain, you want to know whether they are irreplaceable um, and whether you can exit them and what impact would it have on your business? Um, and and I, I know that's a very broad answer, but I don't think time allows us to, to, to really yeah. get into the nitty gritty details of that. As far as the debtor is concerned, you need to realistically look at your future projections and say, can I reorganize this company? Are we better off with an orderly wind down or a sale of assets which keeps the production capacity in the market um, and and provides our customers and and, and others with uh, the, and even employees with the best possible landing point what and what have your communications with both your lender and your customers been uh, because that will greatly assist you in in at least uh, formulating a realistic exit plan so thank you um okay so we have about a minute and a half left and mike you get the last question and there's been a couple interesting questions so i'm going to mention two of them and let you weave them how how you think's best and one is with the current COVID situation done what has it done to alter the priorities of the auto industry over the next five or ten years and then the other question was, uh, what will be the catalyst resulting in greater adoption of electrical vehicles in the U.S.? Not yeah. sure those are related, but we'll find out right now. They they are a little related and 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 intertwined as well. So the, the altering the priorities has been interesting. So to frame that to start, and I alluded to it a little bit, but to expand on it a bit further. You know, it's not that we're walking, stepping away from fully autonomous or, you know, anything like that. And, and indeed, most automakers still have, you know, intentions and investments going on there. But clearly, we're seeing that uh, there's a there's a near term and a longer term prioritization to that. The near term is, is very much focused around electric vehicles and in bringing those to market on the one hand. So there is a focus around that infotainment, sort of those customer uh, consumer touch and feel areas for sure as well. And then that, that level two and level three autonomy. So the, the driver assist side. So I, I do think that especially over the next five years, that's going to be a core focus as you get out 10 years and, and beyond. I do think you'll start to see that evolution kick in even further into full autonomy. And, and again, that's going to be percolate and it'll still be going on, but in terms of prioritization, a lot of it's around EVs. And then what do we need to see on the EV front? Uh, it's multifold and, and it's what we're already kind of starting to see or starting to see many automakers tout this. It's range to a great extent. Uh, it's efficiencies in range. And this is something Tesla has been talking a lot about that and watch that for their battery day coming up here 
uh, soon where they'll be talking about getting more out of a smaller battery pack, more range, more density in, in a more cost-effective manner, and the charging infrastructure. We're going to be hearing more and more about that in part of uh, for consumers, and particularly here in the U.S. and in North America, that's something we're going to need to see a lot more activity on. We're already seeing that, a lot of that, but we need to see more of it. You know, we've got 160,000 gas stations. I've talked about that, I think, on prior calls virtually one on every corner and yes many people have their own garage you know that they can have plug a car in potentially but to see and we don't need to see 160,000 charging stations like that or ports if you will or resources but something akin where uh, an increase uh, ability and then the speed of charging that's another focus as well so I think we're going to see a lot more advancements on that in this intervening time period near to intermediate term. Good. Those were my two concerns, actually, about not buying one earlier. Is Absolutely. will there be charging stations and how far? Because you know, I could be in Detroit and then have to run to Grand Rapids or Lansing, and then you're stuck and you gotta go back by the end of the day. And you know, I'm not sure how many people travel like that or want to go from you know Detroit to New York, Florida, whatever. You don't want to be worried about where you plug in right now. You know, you can rest assured you're going to find a gas station somewhere. And it's not, it's a little tougher on the plug in side. Right, right. Well, on that, we've run out of time. As I mentioned, Jonathan will um, post on the Butzel website um, this webinar recorded along with the, um, along with the um, PowerPoint presentations. Additionally, um Christian and um Jeff will post it on the uh National Association of Surface Finishers website and we'll post it on the Michigan Chapters website as well. So you'll have lots of different sources or you can always email me. If you have any questions, um feel free to email me and I'll get them to the right person and we'll get you a response. Um, and if you want any of the PowerPoints emailed to you, I can do that as well. You know, we are here to help you through this time and all times. So don't hesitate to give us a call. That's what we're here for. And thank you, everybody. Again, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Max. And thank you to our audience. And that ends our presentation. Thank you, Beth.